Good evening. So there are notes in the back if you didn't get notes and you want notes. Um, they're in the back if you don't want notes. I'm not offended. Um, I understand. Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, that's good. You're going to need them. And you can if you want to. You can open up to the Gospel of Luke. We won't get there for a while. But you can open up there if you want. Uh, This is, as you know, our third week. Coming down with something. So my voice feels like it's breaking all the time. Um, This is our third week in a series. We're working our way through the Apostles' Creed. And uh, the Apostles' Creed, if you remember, it is the oldest and the simplest of all the Christian creeds. Now, by saying simple, I don't mean it's dumbed down. Um, It's not. It's actually quite rich. Uh, All Christian tradition, what I mean by simple, though, is it's, it's a story that's easy to capture and easy to memorize. And you should be able to memorize it in like a couple days. In our home, I would tape it to our refrigerator because my kids were constantly going to the refrigerator. And I thought, if you're going to walk to the refrigerator 15 times in a day, at least make it useful and productive besides just cramming your face full of food. Um, Memorize a section of the creed every single day. And my, you know, I did this for, I don't know, a couple years ago. My youngest daughter, Tessa, had it memorized in a week, which tells you something about how quickly, how often she goes to the refrigerator. Um, But it's super simple to memorize. It is, it's in such concise language, and yet it tells the storyline of the scripture so fully that you can memorize it quite, quite quickly. Um... And all Christian traditions recognize its importance as a standard of, of doctrine. Now, um, each week, I think it's important to note, we're not preaching the creed itself, right? Uh, we're not looking at the creed, preaching the creed. What we're doing is we're letting the creed point us to the Bible. Because the authority isn't in the creed. The authority is in the scriptures. So we're going to, we're letting the creed point us to the Bible, what the Bible says about the essentials of the Christian faith. And then we preach through the scriptures. And it's our hope that as we do this, uh, what the creed and what the scriptures will do side by side is it'll anchor us in our convictions. The creed and the scriptures should anchor us in our convictions. And this is what the creed has done, by the way, for 1,500 years. The creed has corrected error by guiding people into truth. And it's our hope and it's our expectation that as the creed will do it again as we work our way through the series. Additionally, it's our hope that it will foster our community. Well, how does the creed foster community? It reminds us for 15, 2,000 years, but for the last 1,500 years, all around the globe, down through the ages, people have been reciting the same creed. They've been uh, declaring the scripture, the storyline of the scripture through the Apostles' Creed. So each time you you, uh, recite the creed, you're reminded that you belong to a community that is so so much bigger than yourselves. You belong to a diverse family made up of all the people of God all around the globe who come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So it'll foster our community. And then lastly, it's our hope that it'll shape our, conf- it'll shape our confession. Meaning, it'll help you, I hope, to better equ- it'll better equip you to sh- uh, share the storyline of Scripture. And the hope that is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's our prayer that as we work through the creed week after week, uh, you'll be better equipped to give uh, a reason for the hope that you have. Now, remember, the creed starts with, I believe. Look at the creed. Note that. It's, it starts with, I believe. Not, I know. And that's an important distinction. While mental assent to the, to the facts of faith is critical, it has to move beyond mental assent. It has to. 
It has to move beyond mental assent to a heart commitment, a disposition of the heart where we believe. And so, as we do each week, let's read the creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose from, he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. That's good. That sounded good. Now, two weeks ago, Pastor Bill started by talking about the first two words of the creed, I believe, and he talked about the nature of belief. And uh, the nature of belief, it has to be embraced with the head, uh, but then it has to be embraced with our heart, and then it has to be embraced with our hands in obedience to God and in service to our fellow man. Then last week, uh, Rick, good Dr. Boya, talked about um, God the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. And he camped on how God is infinitely powerful. His, his power is seen in um, his relation to us. He, he is all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful. But at the same time, he's also uh, a father. There's a real fatherly tenderness there. Um, he's an incredibly loving, personal father who runs to anybody who repents. Just like the father in the prodigal son account. He's like a father who runs to anybody who repents, and he lavishes us in his mercy, in his care and compassion, and he clothes us in his righteousness. Now, this week, what the creed will do is it moves us into the heart of the gospel by focusing on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Um, and the section on the person of the, and the work of Jesus Christ, it's the longest section in the creed, and rightly so, because who Jesus is And what he has done, it's the most important news in the world. What he has done is and is still doing, by the way, because the creed talks about that, gives meaning to all of our lives and it gives shape to the rest of the creed. And so tonight we're going to camp on just the first line regarding Jesus, where the creed states, and you affirm by reciting it, that I believe in Jesus Christ. His only Son, our Lord. And that's all we're going to look at tonight. And you may be thinking to yourself, wait a second, we're going to spend the next 40 minutes just on one line? Oh, man. We could do this for hours. Just this one line. I I, I was in my last section of the notes uh, like 30 minutes ago because I just, well, maybe an hour ago. I was just finishing up about an hour ago. And I cut it short. Because I knew if I expanded it, we'd be here way past 8 o'clock. We'd be here probably till 9 o'clock. And nobody wants to be here at 9 o'clock. So, we're going to spend the next 40 minutes just on that line. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. Have you ever actually considered what you're saying when you say, I believe in Jesus Christ? I mean, seriously. Have you considered what you're actually saying When you say, I believe in Jesus Christ. Have you ever wondered why the name Jesus Christ is more powerful than any other name out there? You ever wonder why when you're playing a sport, when you were a child, you never hear anybody yell, Joseph Smith. You never hear that. Nobody yells Joseph Smith on a playground basketball court. Nobody yells Muhammad. They always yell, at least in the courts that I grew up playing on, they always yelled Jesus Christ. And so I wonder if you've ever really considered, what does it mean to actually say, I believe in Jesus Christ? You guys know um, a guy, there's a guy by the name of Albert Moeller. He's the president of a seminary in uh, Louisville. One of the, the deepest thinkers in our world, honestly, and one of the most prolific writers. Anyways, years ago, he was invited to a theological debate in Washington, D.C. And the organizers of the, de- the, the debate were having a heck of a time finding anybody who would actually represent Orthodox Christianity. 
And so they called up Moeller after uh, trying to find all these other people and, and kept getting shot down. And Moeller said, sure, I'll do it. And he, he said, sure, I'll do it, knowing that it was the type of debate where the Orthodox faith was going to be humiliated. The organers, organizers were going to try to, to humiliate the Orthodox, ba- uh, the or- Orthodox faith. And yet Moeller said, sure, I'll come and represent the Orthodox faith. Faith, And as the debate goes, as, as most debates goes, there was questions from the audience. Audience members could par- participate. And at one point, a man stood up and he said, I have two PhDs, one in astrophysics and another one I can't remember what it was in, but it was some type of science program. So he's an in- incredibly highly intelligent individual. And he, he had told Moeller that he had, studied the, uh, he had studied theology in college, and he was a senior scientist at NASA. And then the man said to Muller in this unbelievably uh, crazy statement, he says, Dr. Muller, I'm just so tired of all of this theology. I'm so tired of theology. I'm tired of all this doctrine. Every time somebody asks you a question, you respond, with a theological answer. And I'll never forget what Muller said. He looked at the man and he said, you see there on the program, it says this is a theological debate. <laughs> Someone with two PhDs should understand what that means. And he kind of ticked the man off a little bit. You could kind of see him. Go, and so the man said to Muller, I'm just tired of theology. I'm a Christian, and I'm tired of theology. All I want is Jesus Christ. Now, if you heard a statement like that, what would you say? I'm so tired of all of this theology. I just want to talk about Jesus Christ. That man, without maybe unwittingly, probably unwittingly, he didn't know that he had just made one of the most profound theological statements that a human can possibly make. Just by saying the name Jesus Christ, you have entered into the most theological, you've, you, you've exploded that, that term. The name Jesus Christ is Im- filled with theological implications. See, a lot of people think that Christ is Jesus' last name. Like in Palestine, there was a mailbox with the word Christ on it, and you would put mail in it. It wasn't a surname. And what this man had unwittingly done is, is he had made a huge theological statement. This man who said he wanted nothing to do with theology, by naming the name Jesus Christ, had made a profoundly theological statement. He unwittingly had declared Jesus to be the anointed one of God, the Messiah. Because again, Christ is not a surname. Christ is a title. Jesus Christ is not merely a name. It is the utmost theological statement. And so before we consider anything else, before we move on to the rest of the creed, we need to consider what we're saying when we're reciting this part of the creed which says, I believe. Because by reciting it, what you're saying is, I believe in something. I've given my, my head over to something, I've given my heart over to something, and hopefully my hands will, be, will follow in service. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, God's only Son, because the first line is about the Father, His only Son, our Lord. Now, listen, every single one of those words carries tremendous weight. Um, so, first fill in, under three, Roman numeral three, is Jesus of history. Because you've got to start there. Jesus of history. And there has been all sorts of studies done that try to undermine the gospel accounts on the person of Jesus. You'll hear, especially around um, Passion Week each year, you'll see new books published or you'll see new television programs with the title, The Quest for the Historical Jesus. Have you seen those before? Books or titles or um, um, books or TV or, um, television programs 
or articles that will say something along the lines for the quest for the historical Jesus. Or you'll see something that says the Jesus you never knew, <laughs> which is always my favorite. The Jesus you never knew. Oh, okay. Well, let's see the Jesus I never knew. What, and what they're essentially doing is they're essentially trying to fashion a f- and form a Jesus of their own making. They'll look at the gospel accounts and they will say, well, the gospel accounts are openly trying to persuade and convert people. And that's absolutely true. They're right about that. John chapter 20, verse 31 says, These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. So they're right about that. The gospel writers are actively trying to persuade you and convert you to the person of Jesus Christ. But what many of these scholars do is they, is that, uh, they think because the gospel writers are biased, they automatically approach the gospel accounts skeptically. But we have every reason to believe that what the gospel authors are telling us um, is true. Because all of the gospel writers, all the early evidence points to an early publication of the gospel accounts written by people who knew Jesus within, uh, within their lifetime. Which means you can honestly, I gave you this quote, we can honestly take the New Testament portrait seriously. As redemptive history, it is redemptive history. It's telling us about the redemption of humanity, but we can also take it as redemptive history, meaning it's real history. There's real history, uh, hist- um, history behind it. It's all very well evidenced. Biased observers can report accurately. And we know that because we watch the news. They actually can report accurately. And whatever else we're dealing with in the Gospels, they claim to be men, they claim to be um, from men, they are from men who claim to be eyewitnesses. These are written by men who were eyewitnesses of Christ's Christ's life, his death, his resurrection, and they had no reason for reporting it other than it was the truth. Because they knew it was going to cost them. They knew they were going to they were going to be persecuted for stating what they knew to be true. So, turn with me, Luke chapter 1. We'll just start working through some of the material now. And we'll try to move quickly <clears throat> as best we're able. Luke chapter 1. Luke writes this, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time, for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. And uh, Luke, historically is known, is uh, historically known as an excellent historian. What he writes, uh, both secular and um, Christian authors will tell you, Luke has written a very well-documented historical um, resource. Uh, Even if they don't say that, that he's inspired, like a, from a secular point of view, even if they say he's not inspired, but what he reports has a lot of historical backing to it. Everybody says that of Luke. Turn over to uh, Second Peter. Second Peter is near the end of your Bible, in case you're not familiar. It is, of course, after First Peter. And it's, uh, what is after it? First John? Yeah. 2 Peter chapter 1, look at what Peter says, Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16, he says, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He's saying, we didn't make any of this up. We were there. We were with them. Uh, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And he's probably, this line right here, eyewitnesses of his majesty, it's probably referring to the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter's probably remembering back to the Mount of Transfiguration when he saw Jesus. Um, and uh, the Lord come down and descend and Jesus talking with God, um, with the Father. He's saying, we were there. We saw it. We were eyewitnesses. We didn't make any of this up. This is historically accurate. Turn over uh, one page to 1 John. First John 1. Look at uh, verses 1 through 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life of was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. Hmm. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed, our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. He's saying we've seen the risen, we've seen Christ. We've seen him, we've touched him, we've talked to him, we've, we've done it all. We're writing to you these things so that you may come to know the truth about who Jesus is. So even one who can't accept that the New Testament documents are inspired by God must at least admit that these documents are normative for our understanding of Jesus of history. They are the primary sources for our understanding. So what we're saying is these are the normative documents uh, for our understanding of Jesus of history. And of course, there's also secular uh, authors of the time, secular sources of the time like Josephus and Tatius. They all attest. They both attest to Jesus' life and they even attest to Jesus' uh, ability to perform miracles. And they attest to the resurrection. We'll talk about that when we get into the resurrection. They attest to the resurrection. They attest to the life of the early church. All that to say, now listen, all that to say is there's more historical evidence. Did I give you this? Yeah. There is more historical evidence for the life of Jesus than any other historical f figure that we take for granted. So when you get into conversations with people, um, don't ever waver on was Jesus an historical p p person. Of course he was. Uh, and it, it, by the way, it is becoming more and more, um, it's becoming more and more that people in scholarly debates are saying we're not even sure if Jesus really existed. Don't even follow that line of logic. It's hogwash. I give you another quote here by Eric Myers, who is a, a professor at, of Judaic studies at Duke University. So again, not a, not a uh, solid theological seminary by any means, but look at what he says. He says, I don't know any mainstream scholar who doubts the historicity of Jesus. The details have been debated for centuries, but no one who is serious doubts that he's a historical figure. So the Gospels present, here's your fill-in, the Gospels present a portrait of Jesus that can be trusted. What the Gospels tell you about Jesus, you can let your weight down on them. Um, they can be trusted. They are historically accurate. So, but the creed doesn't limit itself just to the Jesus of history. It asserts that Jesus is the Christ. The Christ. The Christ of faith. That's your filling. Jesus is the Christ. The Christ of faith. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the term Christian is not a surname, it's a title. Uh, Christ is the Greek version of the Hebrew word Messiah. And in calling Jesus the Christ, 
the New Testament writers, the early church, and you, by reciting the creed, are pointing to Jesus and you're saying he is the long-awaited Messiah. He's the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. He's the fulfillment of the storyline of the scripture. He's the fulfillment of the promised one who would come from Eve, who would be bruised, but he would crush the serpent. He is all the way back there. Um, You're affirming all of that. The Messiah was the long-awaited deliverer of the people of God, promised within the pages of the Old Old Testament. And um, although the Messiah, over the centuries, as as, uh, the people of God formed, there was... There were so many understandings and so many um, expectations. There was um, a, what, what the Messiah would be like, but there were two particular strands that stood out. Two particular ways of understanding the Messiah. The first, your fill-in, is the son of David. The son of David. That's your fill-in there. Um, the most expected, the most popular... And the most expected type of the Messiah was a Davidic king. Uh, Because the Old Testament reign of David was Israel's glory days. I mean, you guys know this. If you've been in the scriptures any amount of time, you know that uh, Israel under David, they blossomed and they prospered. David excelled as a military leader. He expanded the borders of Israel. He brought peace to the surrounding nations by strength. Under David's leadership, Israel flourished. The people prospered. They had great strength. They had prosperity. And then the golden age um, of Israel was tarnished under Solomon's rebuilding program. And then the nation split under Jeroboam and Rehoboam. But the memory of the glory days of Israel, it lived on, even under the oppression of Rome. And the people of Israel, they looked to God to provide a son of David who would restore the glory of Israel. And the frenzy of this expectation surrounding this potential Messiah was not simply based on nostalgia. It was based on Old Testament scripture. It was based on 2 Samuel chapter 7. It was based on Psalm 132. Turn to Psalm 132. It was rooted in God's word to his people. First, of course, was the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7. But then also in Psalm 132, it comes out really clearly. Once you're in 132, skip down uh, to verse 11. Look at verse 11. It says, the Lord, Yahweh, all caps, uh, that's Yahweh, swore to David a sure oath from which he will not, the Lord will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. He's saying he will be there. There will be a permanent king from your body who will sit on your throne. Um, keep going. If your sons keep my covenant and my testimonies that I shall teach them, their sons also forever shall sit on your throne forever. Listen to what he, well, look at what he says throughout Israel's history. This hope of restoration was right there. They're saying this is his throne. David's throne is going to be revived. It's going to be flourished. It's going to be strengthened. God promised through his prophet that this would come about. And then in Amos chapter 9, I don't, uh, did I give that to you? Yeah, Amos chapter 9. You don't need to turn there, I'll read it to you. In that day, Amos says, the Lord says through Amos, in that day I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruin, and build it as it used to be. Now, given all of that, what we just read there, and given the fact that Jesus was from what tribe? Thank you. It was from the tribe of Judah. 
The tribe of Judah was promised the scepter back in Genesis chapter 49. We just finished Genesis. One from the tribe of Judah would have the scepter. And Jesus was born in the city of David and was the descendant of David. And you could see why. When Jesus comes on the scene, you could see why on Palm Sunday, as he's riding into Jerusalem, the crowd start shouting, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And you can also see why in Acts chapter 1, after his resurrection, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? See, they're saying, you're the Davidic king. Both, both when he rode into Jerusalem the, the worshippers thought that. And, and then after the resurrection, his disciples said, you truly are the Davidic king. You are the one that is going to rule and reign. So at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus, remember what Jesus doesn't do? He doesn't respond in frustration. He doesn't respond and says, I'm not going to do that. He doesn't do that. So it's not a matter of whether he will. It's just a matter of when he will. So when we confess that Jesus is Christ, Jesus is the Christ, one of the things we're saying is that Jesus is the king. And more than that, he's our sovereign king. He's our sovereign king whose words and ways shape our life. That's what living under kingship means. The king's ways and the king's words shape all of your existence. Right? That's what living in a monarchy means. The king's ways and the king's words shape your life. That's what Jesus is. He's the, our sovereign king, and his words and his ways shape our life. So, the, we're saying that. So, the son of David is clearly an earthly figure, a human king. But the next title that gets applied to Jesus is not an earthly figure, but a heavenly figure and a heavenly king. And that's the title, and that's your fill-in, the son of man. The son of man. Um, the son of man is Jesus's favorite way to reference himself. It's used 84 times in the New Testament. 81 of, the, 81 of those times is on the lips of Jesus himself, referring to himself uh, as the Son of Man. And he's drawing, what he's doing is he's drawing from the imagery of Daniel chapter 7. So in your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel is after the book of Ezekiel. It's uh, before the book of Hosea. Remember, we're talking about what does it mean that he's the Christ? First of all, he's the son of David, which is a human figure, a human king. That's the first expectation, that he will rule and reign as a king, an earthly king. But there's more, because the next one is the son of man. And that comes straight out of Daniel chapter 7. Look at uh, Daniel 7, verse 13. Daniel's given this vision, and he says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, <clears throat> there came one like a son of man. By the way, just stop right there. When Jesus comes back in Revelation 19, what's he coming on? What? Come, yeah, that in the clouds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the white horse and the clouds. He's, so behold, this vision. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days. That's a reference to the father. And was presented before him. And to him was given, notice this, dominion. And glory and a kingdom. That all peoples, <clears throat> all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Look at what's said here about, uh, about the Son of Man. He says, everlasting dominion. 
And the son of David now links with the son of man. Both are involved here. Now think about this. Both are involved in kingship. Both are involved in dominion and power. While the son of David is an earthly figure, the son of man is a heavenly being. Now note these, these realities about the son of man. He's pre-existent. Pre-existent. Second, he has divine authority. This all comes out of Daniel 7. He's pre-existing. He has divine authority. He has an eternal kingdom. This all comes out of Daniel 7. Now, think about this. When Jesus shows up on the scene and he starts identifying as the Son of Man, he says, in one occasion, he says, um, after healing a man, he says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, I'm God in the flesh. I'm God in the flesh. The one who created everything, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. I'm Lord of the Sabbath. Another occasion, he says, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. You know what he's saying when he's saying these things, when he's making these statements? Every time Jesus uses that phrase, the Son of Man, He's making astounding claims, and everybody knows it. Every single Jewish person knows exactly what he's saying, and they know that they have to make a choice. They have to make a choice regarding him. Is he actually who he claims to be? Is he or is he not the Christ, the son of David, who is also at the same time the son of man, which is why everything hinges on what you do with Jesus' question, the question that he put to Peter, who do you say that I am? And what is, well, what does Peter say? He says, you are the Christ. That's a theological statement. Peter's looking at him and saying, you are the long-awaited Messiah. You are the son of David. You are the son of man. And we don't have time. You can tie in the suffering servant um, in Isaiah. We'll talk about it on the next couple of Sundays after this Sunday. Um, the suffering servant theme is also part of this. We just didn't have time to get into it tonight. And what Peter is saying is, you are indeed the Christ. You're the fulfillment of scriptures. Which means, now here's what it means. You tie all these, what we just looked at. Jesus is the Jesus of history. But he is also the Christ of faith. He is, at, he is one and at the same time, a historical figure who is also the fulfillment of scripture. And you can see him as both of those things. He is a historical figure, but he is also the fulfillment of Scripture, and he has drawn me into faith. He has drawn me into faith that this historical person who entered into human history as Jesus is also the fulfillment of Scripture. He's the promised Messiah, the one who is delivering the people of God. And both of those things are true at the same time. And the creed asserts it, and you, occur, uh, you assert it as well. But then the creed moves on to highlight the uniqueness of Jesus' person and work. And it says, next part, his only son. That's your fill-in, his only son. And man, we've got to move quick. So the creed is going to start talking about the uniqueness of Jesus' person and work. So turn to John, the Gospel of John. John chapter 1. Look at what John writes here in uh, John 1, verse 1. In the beginning <clears throat> was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. There's just so much just in those two verses. First you see the word, um, you see the phrase, the word, right there. The word comes from the Greek term logos. Logos refers to a basic concept or an inward thought. And also to the verbal expression of that thought, spoken or written, that gives expression to the thought as it's revealed. Because the inward thought remains invisible. It remains unknowable until it's expressed, right? You can have an inward, 
We all do this. But the only reason you're able to have any relationship at all is because you're able to hide your inward thoughts. Is that not true? Yeah, it is. It's absolutely true. The moment we often get times get in trouble is when we reveal our thoughts <laughs> to other people. But the inward thought, it remains invisible and unknowable until it's expressed through a word, through a logos. And John begins his gospel by stating that the second person of the Trinity, who is the word, will fully reveal God's heart and God's mind and God's will for humanity because he's the embodiment of God. And John goes on and says, look at verse 3, all things were made through him, so he's the creator, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that, light, uh, and, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So look at what John says about the pre-incarnate Christ, because you'll see in a second this is all talking about Christ. First of all, he says he's eternal. In the, in, uh, the phrase, in the beginning, it refers to a point in eternity beyond past where our minds can go. Before the earth, before the planets, before stars, before light, before darkness, whoa, before <laughs> matter, uh, before time, in the beginning that never really had a beginning, what John is saying is that Christ existed. He was the second person of the Trinity. He's eternal, which means he wasn't a created being. He has always existed, and that's really critical for us to understand because the Jehovah Witnesses and some other groups teach that Jesus existed before the incarnation. They do teach that. He, he existed before the incarnation, but they deny his eternal existence, teaching that he was the first creation of God. But that's not what John says here. And that's not what Jesus says elsewhere. In John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus, he's in an argument with the Jewish folks. And he says, before Abraham was, I am. And by saying I am, he's using God's covenant name with Israel. And he's declaring his self-existence. He's saying, I've always existed. So the first thing John tells us about the pre-incarnate Christ is that he's eternal. Second, John says, he's in equal relationship to God the Father. He's in equal relationship to God the Father and God the Spirit. When John writes, the word was with God, that implies an open, face-to-face, -face, equal relationship with God the Father and God the Spirit. Next, John also says, that the pre-incarnate Christ is distinct from God the Father and God the Spirit. So he is equal, and yet he's distinct from. In his essence, Jesus is equal with the Father and the Spirit, but he exists, and he has always existed, as a separate person within the Godhead. So John makes this packed Trinitarian statement that Christ shares the same essence of God, and yet is, in his personhood, distinct from God. Um, so, huge, huge statement. So he opens up his gospel by declaring that the word, the Logos, the second person of the Godhead, is eternal, equal to God, yet distinct from God. And he presents the pre-incarnate Christ as the eternal word. And now, skip down to verse 14. Look at what John tells us here. And it would have blown everybody's mind. It, it should blow your mind, but you've probably read it so many times, it doesn't blow your mind anymore. But it most certainly should. Look at what he says. And the word, this one who is God, became flesh. And dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now look at this. What John just said is that the creator God, the one who was there, was the um, project manager of creation, has entered into his own creation. God became a man. That is remarkable. This is what blows everybody's mind. It's really God becoming really human. 
deity and, human, deity and humanity permanently joined together. Permanently joined together. Deity and humanity permanently joined together in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God's final and full revelation. He's not his exclusive revelation because um, creation is, is part of God's revelation. But he is God's final and full revelation. Which is why in John chapter 14 verse 9 when Philip comes up to Jesus. Do you remember this? Philip comes up to Jesus and says, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus looks at him and he says, Philip, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. He's saying, I am the Father. I am with you. I am God in the flesh. I am with you. I'm revealing God fully to you. So in the Apostles' Creed, did I give you this? Oh, yeah, in the Apostle Creed, uh, it's stating that Jesus is the Son of God. By stating that Jesus is the Son of God, is saying that Jesus is God. And that's really important for two reasons. When the Creed states that Jesus is his only Son, God's only Son, it's saying that Jesus is God. And that's hugely important for two reasons. Why? Well, here's the first one. In the Old Testament, think about it. In the Old Testament, it is God and God alone. God and God alone who can save and redeem his people. It is only God who can save, his, save and redeem his people. Jot down if you want Isaiah chapter 45, uh, verses 21 and 22. So it is God and God alone who can save and redeem his people. And in the Old Testament, it is God and God alone who can receive worship. God and God alone can receive worship. Uh, Exodus chapter 20. And yet, what happens when you come to the New Testament and you come to the early church? What do they start saying about Jesus? What does Acts chapter 4 verse 12 say? There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Wait a second. It is God and God alone who can save and redeem his people. What are these, how in the world did these Jews come to the conclusion that Jesus, in Jesus, in Jesus the Christ, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given, by, given among men by which we must be saved. And how in the world, Thomas, after seeing the resurrected Christ, he worships him by saying, my Lord and my God, it is God and God alone who can receive worship. It is God and God alone who can save people. How did these Jews come to, these Jews who were raised within the synagogue, how did they come to the conclusion that it's Jesus and Jesus alone that can save and redeem his people and it's Jesus who can receive worship? How did they come to that conclusion? What would cause these Jewish people to see Jesus as their means of salvation and worship him as God? Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians is, remember the easiest way to remember where to find Philippians is um, Galatians, General Electric Power Company. G Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Galatians, uh, Ephesians, Philippians, yeah. And then Colossians. Uh, if uh, Philippians, yeah, Philippians chapter 2. Look at verse 5. Look what Paul writes. Paul, the ex Pharisee, who was steeped in Torah. He says, Have this mind amongst yourself amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, 
did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. By taking, the form of a surf, by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Oh my gosh, this is so rich. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Why did they come to this conclusion? Because they saw in Jesus that he is God in the flesh who enters into his own creation to reveal the Father to humanity, to rescue and redeem the very people who have long rejected him. And they say, we can't get over this. Look at who Christ is. Look at what Jesus has done. He is God and he is saving us. He is God and we will worship him because he has done this. It's marvelous. Do you see how rich this is? It's just this first line in the creed. It's just amazing. And then we'll keep going because I'm running out of time. Gosh. Lastly, the creed states that Jesus is our Lord. Our Lord. I love that line. It's just so rich. Jesus is our Lord. In confessing Christ as Lord, the Apostles' Creed, what it actually is doing, is it's echoing the primary confession of, the primary confession of faith of the apostolic church. Because the, the earliest creed is found in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. The simplest creed is Jesus is Lord. It comes right out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. Jesus is Lord. But it had, had all, all sorts of implications. Because the word Lord, uh, uh, koreos in Greek, it, it can mean a couple of different things. It can, it can be a polite form of, of address. That's one way. It can also... Uh, designate a master. But it could also designate a person of imperial power and authority. It can designate all of those things. But more often than not, it has to do with Jesus being uh, the imperial power. He's the real king who has all authority. Peter's great sermon on the day of Pentecost, after telling his audience that Jesus had been raised from the dead, Peter says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, Christ, both Lord, made Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you, crucif you crucified. God has made him both Lord, Master, the one you will serve, the true King, and Christ, whom you have crucified. He is the Lord, but more than that, if he's a Christian, if you're a Christian, he's more than just the Lord. If you're a Christian, he's your Lord. He's your savior. He's your king. He's your master. He's more than just a, the, the Lord. He's our Lord. Because at the heart of the Christian faith is the believer's personal submission to the authority of God's exalted king. The true king. And your submission to him. Now look at everything we just said. And I, I told you we'd move quick through that last part. Look at everything we just looked at and think it through as, we, as I read it. What the creed says and what you assert is, I believe in Jesus, the Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. Now, if you actually are saying, I believe that, I'm not just giving mental assent to it, but that's the disposition of my heart, well, how would you respond how should we respond to this wonderful section of the creed? Let me give you three ways. Here's the first way. There should be a willing recognition. A willing recognition. A willing recognition. We must see Jesus as he really is. We've got to see him as he really is. The Jesus of history is the Christ of faith. He is God in the flesh who came from heaven to earth 
to reveal God to us, to rescue us and redeem us. And Jesus is our, mis- or Jesus is our window into the mystery of God. He's, our, he's the window into the mystery of God. In John chapter 1, verse 18, I didn't, have you read it, I didn't have you read it earlier. John writes this. He says, No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. But he, referring to Jesus, he has made him known. Which means, if you want to know what God's like, you look to Jesus. You want to know what God's character is like? You want to know what his compassion is like? You want to know what his love is like? You look to Jesus. Uh, Turn, we have time, turn to Hebrews. I saw the guy last week kept you until 820. I was tempted to do the same. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews is after, uh, well, after Philemon which is only a page, before James. So if you've gone to James, you've gone just a tish too far. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. <clears throat> but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God. And the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the, by the word of his power. We'll go ahead and stop there. He, uh, he's the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus is the final and full revelation of God. Which again means if you want to know what God's like, you simply must look to Jesus. And more importantly... If you want to know God, you want to actually know God, you must come to Jesus. You must come to Jesus as both the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. He is the Messiah. He is the fulfillment of the, all of the scriptures. So how should we respond? First, a willing recognition. Second, with glad submission. With, with glad submission. Glad submission. Um, well, how do we do that? How do we do it? How do we how do we do it with glad submission? Well, here's how: you come under His lordship, and again, you allow His words and His ways to shape our lives. You allow this King, who is so countercultural to all the other kings of the world, all the other kings of the world say, "You must die for me." Jesus comes and says, "I will die for you." You come under my loving lordship, and so it is a glad submission. It is saying, Lord, I believe you, I trust you. You have done all of this for me, and I will willingly, joyfully come under the Lordship of Christ, and I will let your words and your ways shape my life. And let's be honest, though. It's possible to pay lip service to Jesus as Lord and yet deny him by how we live. That's why Jesus said in in the end days, Many will come to me and they will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this for you and didn't we do that for you? And he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. So it's possible to pay lip service that Jesus is Lord. But the proof is in the pudding if our lives actually match up with our confession. Right? So, how should we respond? A willing recognition, glad submission. Here's the third one. By joyful exaltation. Joyful exaltation. Again, I said it in the opening, Christians should be the most joyous people in the world. And I am so sick of dour, sour Christians. Just fuels me and ticks me off like nobody's business. It just makes me think, boy, nobody, you don't understand the gospel at all. Are there things to be upset about? Sure there are. Are there seasons of our life that we go through really hard things? Yes, there are. But when you actually meditate upon who Christ is and what he's done, when you let the gospel fill you up again and again and again with wonder, with wonder that God has entered into his own creation, that God would be so moved with compassion that he would come and live the life that I should have lived but I never did, and he would die the death 
that I deserve to die, but I never will, so that I can be forgiven, clothed in his righteousness, given new life in his name, that should fill you meditation to the point of appreciation and then joyful exaltation. Wherever we go in, in our lives, we're just able to say, my circumstances may suck. <laughs> my circumstances may really suck. But my king does not. My, my king fills me with joy. I live my life for him. And even though the circumstances of my life are hard right now, I'm trusting the Lord. I'm trusting my sovereign king. That's joyful exaltation. And we're called to do that. And we respond that way. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. I'll let you go. <clears throat> Father, we pray that just as we talked about, there would be a willing recognition, glad submission, and joyful exaltation. When we think about who you are, um, these things would be our responses that we would see you, we would recognize you for who you are and what you have done, that we would come under your loving lordship and that we would tell others of the amnesty that's available through our king, through simple repentance, repentant faith, and new life in your name. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We pray that as we go home, um, our lives today, the rest of this evening, and on into the rest of this week uh, would actually tell of the good news of the gospel. So we trust you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.